Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is the convincing evidence of realities that are not seen. But now, what would be an example of that? Let's read together Hebrews 11.3. It says, By faith we perceive that the systems of things were put in order by God's word so that what is seen has come into existence from things that are not visible the systems of things. What might be some of those systems? Think about our Earth's atmosphere, which protects us from the sun's harmful rays, while at the same time allowing the entry of essential heat and light. Just think what would happen to us were it not for our atmosphere's protective shield. We'd burn up in seconds. And besides of blocking out harmful rays, the atmosphere along with Earth's magnetic field also absorbs much of the debris that flies through space. By faith, we perceive that these systems were put in order by God's Word. Or think about the Earth's amazing cycles. Imagine what would happen if a city's water supply, its fresh air, its water, uh, were, were disrupted and the sewers were blocked, uh, what would be the quality of life in that city? And yet, our planet is a closed system. Clean air and water are not shipped in from outer space. Waste matter is not rocketed out. So how does the earth remain healthy and habitable? The water cycle, the carbon and oxygen cycles, and the nitrogen cycle, all tuned precisely to sustain life. Of course, this doesn't mean that we can be careless stewards of our planet, but what remarkable systems! And much more could be said about the Earth's perfect location in our solar system, or about the planet's perfect orbit, tilt, rotational speed, and unusual moon, or about our solar system's perfect position in the Milky Way. Are all of these precise locations and elegant measurements the result of blind chance or of purposeful design? David Schaefer, Governing Body Helper, is here using his talk at the 2021 Powerful by Faith Convention, Why We Have Faith in God's Existence. He's using it to insult our intelligence with the same old, tired, hucksterish arguments that creationists have been using for decades and which have been long debunked. In this instance, he's using what's called the fine-tuning argument. He's saying, look at how finely tuned our universe is. Our universe is precisely tuned you know, at an atomic level, our planet is finely tuned with its atmosphere, with its various cycles. Everything has been made perfectly, seemingly, with humans in mind. There's actually a brilliant answer to the fine-tuning argument in a book by an author that I absolutely love, who sadly has passed away some time ago, Douglas Adams, who wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, in his book, The Salmon of Doubt, wrote the following. This is rather as if you imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, this is an interesting world I find myself in, an interesting hole I find myself in. Fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggeringly well must have been made to have me in it. This is such a powerful idea that as the sun rises in the sky and the air heats up and as gradually the puddle gets smaller and smaller, frantically hanging on to the notion that everything's going to be all right because this world was meant to have him in it, was built to have him in it. So the moment he disappears catches him rather by surprise. I think this may be something we need to be on the watch out for. Yes, everything is as we need it to be for human life to thrive and prosper. But that doesn't mean that the universe was created 
with humans in mind. Rather, it means that humans were allowed to come into existence because of the pre-existing fine-tuning that was there. We're here as a result of the way the universe is. It could be that there are other universes where the tuning is different, where the makeup of an atom is different, but we happen to live in the universe that we live in and we happen to have evolved on the planet that we've evolved on. And of course, we're going to evolve based on what's around us. And I'm sorry, I realize many of you watching this will be like, oh no, now he's talking about evolution. Evolution's a lie. <laughs> it's this massive conspiracy by scientists. Come on, look into human evolution. Look at the evidence that we have of all of the quote-unquote missing links that came before us. Look at the age of humanity. Look at how old some of the archaeological finds are, dating back many, many thousands of years. We know that humans evolved, and we were going to evolve on a planet that has a water cycle, on a planet that has an atmosphere so that we don't burn to a crisp. The fine-tuning argument collapses when you give it even the slightest scrutiny or thought. And actually, if you're going to argue along these lines that our planet and its cycles and its systems and its food chain and everything, its biological organisms, was perfectly crafted with humans in mind, how do we explain mosquitoes? How do we explain parasites? How do we explain viruses like the coronavirus? How do we explain tectonic activity, volcanoes, earthquakes that kill people? How do we explain tsunamis? Is this part of the fine-tuning? Did God fine-tune our planet and its cycles so that sometimes our planet is hell-bent on killing us and in fact does kill humans? at an astonishing rate, the coronavirus alone, as I'm making this video, we're closing in on 4 million deaths. Is that part of God's fine-tuning? You can't just cherry-pick the things that favour humans and say, ah, this means that there is a God. You have to apply the same logic or the same level of scrutiny to all of the systems, all of the organisms, all of the phenomena and weather patterns and geological activity that is plainly out to kill us, or at the very least, simply doesn't care about humanity and its prosperity. As you watch the following video, note yet another example of how the order evident in creation clearly points to an all-wise creator. Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Yet each individual cell is a marvel of design and organization. Inside our cells, biological processes signal specific proteins to assemble themselves into tracts called microtubules. Tiny molecular machines called kinesins then transport various components to different parts of the cell by walking along the tracks. From microscopic proteins to enormous galaxies, our organized universe abounds with examples of elegant design. So to drive home David Schaefer's tired fine-tuning argument, we have this video pointing out the complexity in our universe, the fact that things on a microscopic level are so sophisticated and complex. As I'm going to be discussing later in this rebuttal, complexity doesn't get you to God when it comes to living organisms. In fact, when you think about it, this video, if anything, should be causing creationists to revisit their cynicism regarding 
a biogenesis, in other words, the study of life arising through chemicals. Because when you saw that visual of the ball of endorphins being dragged along there by a protein molecule, those are chemicals. This isn't a little creature <laughs> that lives in the cell. This protein that's seemingly walking isn't like a little creature with like a little brain and a little digestive system. This is a chemical. It's an unthinking protein that's just reacting chemically to its surroundings. That's what we're seeing. This is how complicated chemicals can be. And what creationists ignore when it comes to abiogenesis is that when we're talking about primordial soups and what could have given rise to the first DNA or RNA, chemicals get multiple chances, infinite chances to get it wrong in those situations. All it takes is for one chemical to make a change and it's done. Infinite possibilities, infinite chances to get it wrong. Only one chance needed for the right chemical reaction to take place. And voila, we have a protein that's capable of doing something like this, of dragging along in this case, a ball of endorphins to make someone happy or to make an organism feel the sensation of happiness. That's how incredibly complicated chemicals are. And I wish creationists would give this more thought. If this is what chemicals can do. I mean, we think of chemicals, don't we? We think back to our time in the chemistry lab at school, when chemicals were just things in test tubes or things that you would heat up with a Bunsen burner and you'd maybe get a flash or they'd bubble up or they'd explode in some way. But this was my experience of chemicals when I was in school. It's only when you go through, frankly, higher education when you learn more about this stuff, that you realize how incredibly complicated chemicals can be, what incredible feats they can achieve, even though they are not creatures, they are not living organisms, they are just molecules. The simple fact that chemicals in nature can do such extraordinary things and be so complex and fulfill all of these incredible roles doesn't get us to an intelligent designer. And even if it did, even if there were some intelligence behind all this, that doesn't get us to the Bible being true, the Bible being the infallible word of God. And it certainly doesn't get us to Jehovah's Witnesses, to Jesus invisibly selecting the faithful slave in 1919, and to the likes of Stephen Lett and Tony Morris being a channel of communication with the Almighty.